This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD 229, MRI signals and sequences offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The 15th lecture, Magnetization and Preparation Part 2, focuses on diffusion and is broken down into three parts. Lecture 15b covers diffusion-weighted imaging. The learning objectives for this lecture include being able to recall a simple expression for how the MRI signal depends on diffusion, to understand how gradients control diffusion sensitivity, to appreciate how the spin echo diffusion weighted imaging sequence is built, to describe the steps required to measure diffusion with MRI, and distinguish high and low apparent diffusion coefficients from diffusion weighted imaging based images. And finally, to explain the concept of T2 shine through from the signal equation. So in the previous lecture, we saw this slide, which conveyed the concept that spin phase depends on the applied gradients and the spin's history, which could, in fact, take the form of a random walk. And for stationary spins, we saw that the phase could be refocused, leading to no, uh, no net phase, whereas for a randomly walking spin, there could be a net phase for an individual spin. And when we consider an ensemble of spins that are diffusing, we'll accumulate a different amounts of phase for each of those underlying spins. And the larger this final phase dispersion, the higher the underlying apparent coefficient. So this principle holds true under a lot of different circumstances and is useful for clinical and research applications. We also saw in that lecture that the signal itself depends on some signal obtained without the presence of the diffusion encoding effects and has a dependence on the so-called B value, which we understood to depend somehow on the gradient waveforms that were applied, as well as the underlying tissues diffusion coefficient. And in this lecture, we'll spend some more time uh, taking a look at the B value itself uh, and then developing some concepts about uh, imaging sequences. So again, let's ask ourselves, what is the B value? Well, there's different ways to apply diffusion sensitizing gradients. In this example of a gradient echo sequence, we could begin with an RF pulse to generate some transverse magnetization, and then we could use a gradient waveform with amplitude G and duration delta. And this is a bipolar gradient with equal and opposite lobes. And that's important because any phase that's generated during the first load needs to be offset by phase um, uh, imparted on the, on the spins by the second lobe so that spins with no diffusion or no net uh, movement will accumulate no net phase. Now, without going through all the mathematical steps to get there, we can understand that the B value depends on the amplitude of the diffusion encoding gradient and this duration delta, as well as some scaling coefficients in the underlying gyromagnetic ratio. So we can calculate the B value uh, for uh, a particular gradient waveform, uh, if it takes this simple form of being two box-like uh, uh, gradients. There's slightly more complicated uh, geometric expressions, or algebraic expressions, when we include, for example, the ramps themselves, or perhaps this lobe is instead of being a box or a trap, could be a sinusoid. Or, of course, we can generalize uh, to uh, integral, uh, integral formulations that take into account arbitrary gradient waveforms. So let's examine uh, again what happens in the presence of the bipolar uh, encoding gradient. So here we're gonna look at uh, a population of spins that are distributed across space, uh, X and Y space, and we'll apply a bipolar encoding gradient and examine what happens to the net phase within a voxel. So again, remember all of these individual particles are uh, diffusing within an individual uh, pixel or voxel in our image, and it's the they each accrue their own individual phase, but it's their ensemble sum that gives rise to the signal that will sample for a particular pixel. And so the diffusion encoding gradients label the spins with MR phase that depends on their position. And if they don't move, then that phase is undone. And then the MR phase for stationary spins, of course, is rewound. So as we animate this, we'll see the effects of the diffusion encoding gradient, which adds phase in a spatially dependent matter and causes the signal to drop substantially. But in the case that the gradient lobe is reversed, we can rephase uh, that spin system and uh, get back to the, um, the baseline level of signal. This is all in the absence of any sort of underlying relaxation effects. So here's a slightly more interesting example where we allow for the diffusion of the spins and play the same gradient waveforms, 
we lose signal during that first gradient waveform, and we're unable to recover uh, the signal during the gradient reversal because the spins have exchanged positions enough such that their, that their spin phase cannot uh, be returned to the original phase. It, it is not a reversible process. And so the MR phase for diffusing spins cannot be rewound, it cannot be refocused, and this leads to a signal loss or attenuation that depends on the underlying diffusion coefficient. The more diffusion that we have, the more net signal loss that we'll have. So in this case, we've given up roughly 95% of our signal as an example. So we can encode uh, diffusion with these large diffusion encoding gradients. We can specify the B value that we want by designing gradients of a particular amplitude and a particular duration. And we can also uh, design these kinds of diffusion encoding gradients for spin echo sequences as well. And it takes a slightly different form, uh, wherein we have an excitation pulse to generate transverse magnetization. We have a large diffusion encoding gradient uh, of amplitude G and duration delta. And then there's some delay, uh, what we call little delta and big delta. There's a big delta delay before we can play a second refocusing pulse, at least because of the fact that we have to play uh, the duration of the refocusing pulse. And so the algebraic expression that defines the B value is similar, but it takes a slightly different form and depends now on the gradient amplitude, little delta, and big delta. In principle, uh, we want to design an experiment for a particular B value, and we typically want these gradients to be as short as possible. So G is, is somewhere close to the hardware's gradient maximum, uh, allowable gradient maximum, and then uh, there's only a few design uh, considerations left at that point, little delta and big delta. So let's think about how we can add these diffusion encoding gradients to a particular sequence. So this is an example of the spin echo sequence that we saw uh, several lectures ago. It begins with an excitation pulse that's slice selective and then some phase encode pre-winding and frequency encode pre-winding. Uh, at a slightly later time, we play a refocusing pulse and uh, that allows us to form our, our main spin echo. Uh, and by uh, a, a, a bipolar uh, gradient waveform in the readout axis, we can acquire different echoes uh, as we, as we uh, move our way through K-space. In this case, the example showing the acquisition of five echoes. Now, the central uh, echo in particular for the spin echo experiment will depend on proton density uh, within the pixel. It will depend on the T1 and the T2 within the pixel, and then the imaging parameters that we choose, that is the TE and the TR. So this is the simple spin echo expression for signal intensity or echo amplitude for the spin echo uh, expression. And this is the spin echo sequence is a common sequence for diffusion uh, imaging because uh, it refocuses uh, the sources of off resonance. Uh, uh, so it has in general robustness to off resonance uh, as well as relatively high signal to noise. Uh, now this sequence uh, as designed here would be inadequate for diffusion encoding because there'd be no sort of place or time during which we could play the diffusion encoding gradients. And so we take the simple step of stretching these, uh, uh, the timing out. We have to delay the timing of the 180 uh, slightly. Uh, that gives us a delay in forming the middle echo. Uh, and the overall image contrast, of course, is still governed by the same spin echo expression, except for in this case now we've lengthened our TE, so we have a little bit uh, more, or we have additional T2 contrast. Now the advantage of having delayed the 180 and the echo time is we've opened up some time here before the formation of, say, the first echo, during which we could play some diffusion encoding gradients. And so that's what we see here. So now we have uh, an example of a diffusion-weighted spin echo uh, EPI sequence where we've added in two diffusion encoding gradients on either side of the 180. Notice that they're both, uh, both upright, so this is diffusion encoding. The spin system is flipped over by the refocusing pulse, and so this is diff uh, diffusion decoding, if you will. And now we can see that the spin echo signal equation has uh, been modified slightly, such that it still has T1 dependence and T2 dependence, but now it has an, the exponential uh, term that we, uh, that we expect, rather, uh, and it depends on both the B value and the underlying diffusion coefficient of the pixel. And so the addition of the diffusion encoding gradient sensitizes the signal equation to diffusion. Now the diffusion gradients could be applied on any axis, we can do it on the x-axis, the y-axis, uh, or the readout axis, in this case here, uh, or any linear combination of the three. And for so-called diffusion tensor experiments, it's actually quite important to design uh, uh, 
different linear combinations of these gradients, such that we're sampling diffusion along different directions. These gradients allow us to sample diffusion uh, just in the slice select direction, and these gradients would allow us to sample diffusion just in the phase encode direction. But if we wanted to, we could play a linear combination of these two and sample diffusion in some diagonal direction. And that's a topic of the next lecture. One thing I'll point out as well, something that we'll pick up in the third lecture, is that by delaying the 180 time uh, and using the simple gradient waveform design, there's also some so-called wasted time. That is some part of your uh, pulse sequence during which you're not actively uh, encoding or decoding or spoiling or anything like that. Uh, and so there are some interesting ideas about how that wasted time might be used to increase overall sequence efficiency or SNR efficiency. Okay, so let's return to this concept again that we saw from the, uh, from the first lecture. We know that the signal depends on some base signal, some S0 signal, weighted by an exponential that depends on the B value and the underlying diffusion coefficient. And we can map out different exponential decay curves according to this expression for different tissue types, white matter, uh, gray matter, and CSF. So the experiment, uh, that is, if you want to actually measure or estimate the diffusion coefficient, the experiments that you need to perform are as follows. First, you would set the B value to be equal to zero. And if the B value here was zero, that would allow you to just measure the S0 signal or the base signal, sometimes what we call the uh, the B0 image or the non-diffusion weighted image. Then you need to do a second experiment where you set the B value to be some non-zero value, and, in, and as a consequence of B being non-zero, then you can actually measure this signal here, which we call uh, just the diffusion weighted signal. And then, uh, in steps that we'll show in just a moment, you can then calculate actually the diffusion coefficient on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. And so uh, it's important to think about the diffusivities of the tissues uh, that you're trying to image. If they have a high diffusion coefficient, that is the spins exchange position pretty rapidly, that will lead to high signal losses because the signals can't be rephased easily. Or you may have tissues with low diffusion coefficients, in which case the spins uh, don't dephase uh, quite as much, and that leads to a lower overall signal loss on the diffusion weighted image. So then in designing your experiment, you have to consider what kind of B value to use. You could choose a high B value, that is you could be out here in the territory of two or three or 4,000 seconds per millimeter squared. Uh, that will give you high diffusion sensitivity, but it will also give you low signal to noise because you've attenuated your signal so substantially by your choice of B alone in combination with your diffusion coefficient. Alternately, you could choose a low B value, but a low B value will have low diffusion sensitivity uh, while at the same time giving you high signal to noise. And so as with many things in MR, it's something of an optimization problem to decide how much signal attenuation you want, how much uh, diffusion contrast you want between tissues, and how that competes with your noise floor. Okay, so let's uh, look a little bit more carefully at how we uh, design these experiments for estimating diffusion coefficients. Uh, the first thing would be a, a spin echo uh, sequence so that we could acquire the S0 image. This image will, of course, be proton density weighted, T1 weighted, uh, and T2 weighted, depending on our choice of imaging parameters. And so typically we would choose to minimize the TE for the best signal to noise. Uh, so we would pack things together as much as we could uh, in terms of gradient waveform efficiency. And we would, in general, uh, uh, try to maximize the TR for the best signal to noise. Now, in principle, your TR could be you know, many, many, many tens of seconds. Uh, so, of course, that would be unreasonable. So I say maximize here in that you want it to be uh, probably many seconds long to get the, the best signal-to-noise uh, efficiency that you can. So now in the second step of the experiment, we turn on the diffusion encoding gradients. We can see that our underlying image here has changed pretty substantially. You can flip back and forth so you can see the effects of the diffusion weighting itself. Uh, and the B value that we've chosen, uh, of course, depends on this algebraic expression that was provided earlier. And if we target a B value of 1,000, then we need to calculate what gradient amplitude, little delta and big delta are needed uh, to get that particular B value. But the B value is what we control on the scanner, similar to how we control the TE and the TR. And so now the signal that we'll measure will depend on all of these things, the TR, uh, the T1, uh, the TE, the T2, the B value, the diffusion coefficient. But we already estimated the, set, the uh, pixels dependence on these, the first set of parameters in the first experiment when the B value was set to zero. 
So when you're making uh, measurements with the diffusion uh, weighted sequence, you would of course want to match the TE and the TR so that you're not changing these components of the underlying image contrast. So they're, they're well matched, that is, to the image contrast of the non-diffusion weighted or S0 image. And then you would adjust the B value for best diffusion contrast or best uh, SNR for the particular uh, application that you have in mind. So then having uh, done two experiments, that's one experiment that was non-diffusion weighted and a second experiment that was diffusion weighted, you would have the signals that you needed for uh, populating uh, these two parts of this expression. Uh, you would also know the B value by design. Uh, that's a parameter that was chosen in terms of designing the gradient waveforms. So the only remaining free parameter is what's called the diffusion coefficient. So you have a single equation and a single unknown and can solve on a pixel by pixel basis the underlying diffusion coefficient. And this lets you do a couple different things. You can, for example, uh, calculate an apparent diffusion coefficient map. Uh, if you know a little bit about neuroanatomy, then you know that uh, this is the ventricles uh, of the brain, and the ventricles are full of cerebrospinal fluid, which we saw on the previous slides is, uh, has a high diffusion coefficient. And so on the ADC map, it's not terribly surprising that the CSF here is very, very bright, whereas the white matter and the gray matter are substantially darker. So here you actually have a technique that, uh, with appropriate corrections, will allow you to measure quantitatively the diffusion coefficient on a pixel by pixel basis. Now another possibility is actually to, um, to compute what's called the trace diffusion weighted image. This is a single diffusion weighted image obtained uh, with diffusion weighting along a particular direction. This might be the z direction. More typically we would get diffusion weighted images along the x, y, and z directions. We could add up those three images and uh, divide by three. That's called the trace and then uh, get a diffusion weighted image that's more, uh, that's slightly improved in terms of signal to noise and also has more even diffusion weighting uh, coming from uh, multiple uh, directions. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples. So this is a diffusion weighted imaging example of a chronic infarct. And the question is, does the lesion have a higher or lower diffusion coefficient? So this is the diffusion weighted image. Uh, and so for reference, we can uh, recall that this is the uh, ventricle of the brain that's full of CSF, and we think that the CSF has a high diffusion coefficient, and on the diffusion weighted image, high, uh, highly diffusive uh, tissues uh, will end up being quite dark. And so uh, we can see that this region over here is a, appears quite abnormal on the diffusion weighted image. Uh, and we would infer that this probably has a rather high diffusion coefficient. We can look more directly at the apparent diffusion coefficient map, and of course we can see that the diffusion coefficient within the CSF is quite large or bright, uh, and that this lesion on the right-hand side is also relatively uh, high in terms of its underlying apparent diffusion coefficient. So this is a nice uh, technique for evaluating uh, changes in the apparent diffusion coefficient uh, in the brain, for example, of a chronic infarct. We can look at another example here. So uh, here we could ask again, does the lesion have a higher or lower diffusion coefficient? Here, uh, the brain is pretty severely affected again. This would be the ventricles. So the ventricle is appearing quite dark. And so we think that uh, we would expect uh, those to be uh, dark because of their high diffusivity on the diffusion weighted image. Um, and we look at these regions here that are appearing quite uh, bright. And that means they have a very low, or we expect that they have a very low diffusion coefficient because uh, there's very little signal loss or signal attenuation on the diffusion weighted image. So those spins are not uh, moving around very much. They're not randomly walking very much during the application of the diffusion encoding gradients. And so when we calculate uh, the apparent diffusion coefficient map, it's perhaps a little bit difficult to see, but we can see that the ADC looks to be actually quite a bit lower in, uh, in a number of these regions relative to the normal uh, brain uh, that's, that's adjacent. Uh, so this appears to be a region of restricted diffusion, uh, which is a known feature for acute strokes and was actually one of the um, sort of landmark discoveries and applications for diffusion-weighted imaging that was made by Mike Mosley when he was uh, at UCSF and is now in our department at Stanford. Okay, I want to point out one last thing, one sort of interesting thing that can happen on diffusion-weighted images. 
And this is an artifact that's called T2 Shine Through, and it's related uh, to uh, a combination of things that happen as a consequence of the signal equation that describes the spin system. So remember again that high signal intensities on the diffusion weighted image could happen for a couple of reasons. It could happen because you have a low or restricted diffusion, that is the spins don't move very far, in which case this term here remains relatively high. Or you could have a long T2, that is the signal didn't have a chance to decay very much because whatever the spin system was, was um, typical of a long T2 species. And so again, this, this uh, term here wouldn't uh, attenuate very much. Uh, in distinction, we could have low signal intensities in the diffusion weighted image, in which case we expect a high diffusion coefficient here, which would give rise to uh, a significant drop in signal intensity. Or if we happen to have a short T2, we could also get a lot of signal decay as a consequence of this T2 term here. The, these two terms sort of uh, trade off with one another, and it's important to take that into consideration when looking at the diffusion weighted images or the, or the apparent diffusion coefficient images. So let me show you what could possibly happen. So here we have what we call a trace diffusion weighted image. So that was diffusion weighted uh, imaging uh, uh, applied in three separate directions and three separate experiments then averaged together. And on this particular image, you'll notice, for example, that the, uh, the ventricles again are very dark, uh, but you have the small lesion here. And the question is, does that represent restricted diffusion? Restricted diffusion would be a low diffusion coefficient and at least from the diffusion weighted image, you would uh, be wondering if that is in fact a real finding in terms of having a low diffusion coefficient. So here we switch to the ADC map and we see something rather interesting. The ADC suggests uh, that the actual calculation of the apparent diffusion coefficient uh, suggests that this small lesion here is actually uh, has a, a relatively high ADC, somewhere, somewhere in between say normal brain and the CSF. And so, uh, uh, the, the trace image suggests it might be restricted. The ADC map suggests that, uh, in fact, maybe it's more freely diffusing. And so it's helpful to look at the T2 weighted image. And on the T2 weighted image, what you see is a lesion here that has a long T2. And so this is an example of T2 shine through on the trace diffusion weighted imaging. Because this T2 happens to be rather long, it becomes uh, rather apparent on the trace image. And that underscores in part the value of the ADC map where you actually calculate a quantitative microstructural characteristic of the tissue and can see that the ADC value is in fact elevated relative to normal tissues. So what else can we measure with diffusion? Well, it turns out we can do lots of things and that's the subject of our next uh, lecture. So please click the links below and join me for that. Thank you.